we had a very um, difficult vote uh, in the Hellenic Parliament uh, last uh, Sunday. Um, we adopted with a substantial majority, 199 MPs out of 300, uh, a new uh, package of uh, reforms and austerity measures, measures uh, amidst uh, uh, significant public discontent, uh, intra-parliamentary dissent, uh, and uh, quite a few riots, which you might have seen on your TV screens. I understand not too dissimilar to the riots that you had after the Stanley <laughs> Cup uh, defeat. Um, so I don't want you to get the impression that uh, Greece is in a state of uh, pre-revolutionary uh, agitation. These were very uh, isolated uh, events. However, um, more than 40 uh, members of parliament from both major parties decided to vote uh, against uh, this, uh, this package. Uh, and over the past week, there has been uh, uh, an, an intense uh, debate going on within the European Union uh, as to whether this package will eventually uh, be approved uh, by the European Union and the Troika. I do anticipate that uh, as of the beginning of next week, uh, the package will be uh, approved. But certainly, the whole debate uh, surrounding Greece, Greece's role within the European Union, Greece's possible exit uh, from uh, the Eurozone is still uh, a very lively debate. And we are just at the beginning uh, of a very long uh, and arduous path uh, towards uh, uh, establishing, re-establishing um, economic uh, sustainability for the country. Uh, so the real question, which I'm sure you have, is how did this whole thing really um, um, happen? How could it be that uh, a country which was, uh, uh, and still is, thank God, uh, part of the, uh, of the core uh, of, uh, of Europe uh, is uh, threatened with expulsion from the, the Eurozone uh, and uh, could be facing a situation of uh, grave um, uh, social uh, discontent uh, and turbulence? What really uh, went wrong? Why did we get into the situation? And uh, what can we do from now on? And uh, is there a way out of this dire situation uh, for the country, but al also for Europe? Because one should forget, not forget that uh, Greece is uh, not the cause, but the symptom of a broader problem within the European Union. So if we want to understand what went wrong um, uh, uh, with the country, one probably needs to go at least a decade back uh, to 2001, when the Eurozone um, was created and the euro uh, was introduced as a national uh, currency uh, for the first countries that became the core of the Eurozone. I still remember very vividly the, the exuberance that surrounded that moment, the first day on January 2nd of 2002, we went to the ATMs and we got uh, our new, uh, brand new uh, euro notes. And there was a lot of enthusiasm uh, at the time about the project of, of European integration. Uh, and that enthusiasm clouded a very basic uh, reality that many countries had actually joined uh, the Eurozone at the time without meeting the basic Maastricht criteria. Uh, Greece uh, joined uh, um, uh, the Eurozone as a result primarily of a political decision, as did many uh, other, uh, other countries. Uh, uh, but it was uh, very clear from that uh, uh, time that in terms of competitiveness, um, Greece and the other countries of the South still had quite a long way to go um, in order to, to reach the point of our, uh, of our northern uh, neighbors. But at the time, that didn't seem to matter. Everyone was very happy with the whole uh, European project. And the end result uh, of this was that Greece was able to borrow for at least uh, almost a decade um, at interest rates which were 30 basis points higher than the interest rates of Germany. Uh, our creditors perceived uh, the country risk of Greece to be basically similar to the country risk uh, uh, of, uh, of Germany and our northern neighbors. And as you know, uh, the first decade of the, uh, of the 21st century was a decade with ample liquidity. And a significant chunk of that liquidity uh, was also channeled uh, towards Greece. Yet during that decade, uh, Greece uh, kept running um, uh, deficits, fiscal deficits but also current account deficits. Uh, and when you have access uh, to uh, ample capital, uh, the temptation to borrow money and spend money 
is significant. So what basically happened is that uh, Greece did not use that period to undergo the, all those structural transformations that would make the economy more competitive. And the main reason why this happened is because uh, uh, Greek politics uh, were still um, governed by a very clientelistic logic. Uh, the idea that you need a, a big state that spends a lot of money to keep your voters happy was still the dominant idea in, uh, in Greek politics. So as long as uh, the governments had access uh, to relatively cheap capital, there was no real uh, incentive to reform. And nobody seemed to notice at the time until uh, the global financial crisis uh, broke out. And after the 2009 elections, um, it came as a shock to our European uh, partners that the actual deficit uh, was much higher than many people had anticipated. Our deficit for 2009 was almost uh, 14%. Uh, and at that time, people started taking notice of what happened uh, in Greece. And what happened was very, very uh, predictable. Uh, bond yields uh, started to increase. The cost of borrowing uh, increased uh, substantially. Uh, and Greece found itself in a position not to be able to refinance uh, its, uh, its debt. Uh, so it uh, turned to the uh, IMF and uh, the European Union and the ECB in uh, uh, April of 2010 uh, to provide Greece with the biggest relief package ever provided uh, to a sovereign state, 110 uh, billion euros. Uh, and in exchange for that package, it uh, um, signed a memorandum um, which basically stipulated very, very clear and very specific steps that Greece needed uh, to take in exchange for the funds uh, it received. Now, if you go two years back, it's interesting to note that when the first memorandum was devised, the prediction at the time was that Greece would be able to tap the international capital markets at the end of 2011. So the idea was that we could solve this crisis relatively uh, quickly, that Greek, uh, the, the confidence uh, in Greece would be uh, restored. Uh, and that uh, basically this crisis could be contained in a relatively short period of time. Now that didn't happen. Uh, and there's a big argument in Greece as to why that didn't happen. Uh, was the initial program poorly designed? Was it poorly implemented? Or is there probably, as I believe, a little bit of truth uh, to, to both uh, of these um, arguments? The truth is that the previous socialist government um, uh, was given an, uh, a choice by the Troika to reduce the deficit either by slashing uh, public spending very aggressively uh, or by increasing taxes. And the government chose to pursue the second path. And it chose to do so because, again, it was uh, very much dependent upon special interests within the government who actually supported the socialist government, who really didn't want uh, you know, jobs to be lost or perks um, to, um, to be slashed. And the government chose um, uh, the path of increasing tax rates substantially. Uh, both VAT uh, and, uh, and uh, taxes on uh, um, uh, income taxes, uh, as well as property taxes. Now, that, that, that didn't work, because if you increase uh, taxes in a um, deflationary environment, uh, what you end up doing is pushing the economy in a deeper recession, which is exactly what happened. At the same time, the government did very, very little to pursue the structural reforms we all recognize were necessary for the Greek economy. Uh, privatizations, liberalization, slashing of red tape, practically nothing uh, happened. And kind of interesting anecdotal story that I have is that um, the government, when, when it sold Olympic Airways, um, basically obtained as, as collateral four uh, Airbuses, um, uh, which kept sitting on the tarmac of the Athens airport for two years. Uh, and we did manage to sell them, you know, two months ago, but at a price that was significantly, obviously significantly lower than what we could have achieved um, uh, two years before. So there was a complete um, uh, capability of, of the government to actually proceed down the path of those uh, structural reforms. So uh, over the past two years, we were constantly chasing fiscal targets we couldn't meet. The recession got deeper, unemployment uh, increased uh, uh, substantially. There was a lot of um, civil unrest, uh, and social unrest. Uh, people felt that they were making sacrifices and that they couldn't see the, uh, the end of the tunnel. Uh, so what happened last October was it, was it became very clear that Greece would need a second um, additional uh, funding uh, to partially replace the first package and to ensure uh, that the Greek state could have access to capital until at least 2015. So there was an agreement uh, at the end of October last year by the European Union and the Troika to provide that funding. And then our ex-prime minister had this brilliant idea 
of um, uh, actually thinking of putting this agreement up to a referendum in Greece after having it uh, agreed with, with, his, with his partners. And then basically all hell broke loose. That was the first time when people seriously questioned the country's commitment to reforms. And it was the first, the first time that uh, we started having uh, a uh, discussion um, as to whether Greece should leave the Eurozone. Um, this was a, uh, uh, a debate which uh, practically was a taboo debate uh, in Europe. Uh, the, the discussion as to whether Greece should leave the, uh, the Eurozone uh, because it could not meet its obligation or possibly because some people make that argument, I completely disagree, it could even be better for Greece if it readopted its national currency, really uh, started over the, uh, over the past uh, uh, three months and we've gone through great effort uh, to contain that debate. So the end result of this process was that we now have a second memorandum which has been um, voted uh, into, into law. I think to a certain extent the second memorandum uh, corrects some of the mistakes uh, of the first memorandum in the sense that it places less emphasis on very strict fiscal targets and more emphasis on structural reforms, uh, labor market reform, privatization, and in particular the overhaul of the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the state bureaucracy. So that agreement has been, uh, has been put into place. As I told you in my introduction, I expect it to be ratified uh, by, the, uh, by, the Euro, uh, by the Euro group and by the uh, IMF. And we should uh, then start the, uh, the process, the difficult process, uh, of implementing uh, these uh, measures. There's also the um, slight uh, complication that we may have a national election uh, in the meantime. Uh, there's a great possibility that we may have a national election uh, uh, in, towards the end of uh, uh, April. Uh, and it is likely that as a result of the election, uh, my party, New Democracy, will probably win, but it may be most likely be forced into a coalition uh, government in order to implement these measures. There has been a very clear commitment um, by both parties, uh, both PASOK and New Democracy, the two main parties, that they will adhere to the terms uh, of the memorandum. So even if New Democracy wins, we have a very clear roadmap. We know um, exactly what it is to, uh, to be done. And our creditors actually asked for these commitments because they wanted to feel sure that after the upcoming uh, elections, uh, there would be no doubt as to what the country's obligations really are. So that brings us to, to today. And you know, the real uh, question is, what do we need to do from now on in order to get out of this uh, difficult situation, whether it is feasible uh, economically uh, and uh, politically, and what are you know, the, the likely um, uh, next steps that will take place in this kind of ongoing uh, saga of, uh, uh, of Greece's financial uh, difficulties. Now, when, when we think in terms of what needs to happen from now on, uh, I think we all always need to think in terms of uh, three uh, critical areas that we need to address, probably simultaneously. The one area has to do with breaking the deflationary spiral. There's no way you can ever balance your books if you have an economy that is contracting at 5 6 uh, percent. Uh, you'll be constantly chasing tax revenues which you will not be able um, uh, to, to get. Now, at the same time, breaking the deflationary spiral also entails making your debt burden um, consistent with the country's ability to repay that debt. Now, that has been partially addressed by the agreement that we signed with the Troika, because part of the deal that we signed uh, is an ex a bond exchange by which uh, private bondholders uh, will exchange their uh, existing bonds for new bonds which would be worth approximately 50 cents uh, to the dollar. So as a result uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this debt swap, uh, Greece will be able to reduce its debt burden by around 70 to 80 billion euros. Now, there's a question in the financial community as to whether this is actually enough to sustain, to, to create a situation which is sustainable. Uh, I'm not able to answer that question uh, right now. There is an argument to be made, uh, and I think a convincing one, that po possibly this haircut should have been even deeper. Uh, because right now, according to the projections of the Troika, we will get to 120% uh, of um, debt to GDP by 2020. Already, there are people who make the argument that that is already uh, too high. And that assumes that things go as planned, which has not been uh, the case. So there is an argument to be made as to whether this haircut should have been deeper. Uh, that is not going to be the case. However, what is going to be the case, most likely, is that the European Central Bank 
will actually participate uh, in this haircut because the European Central Bank bought uh, Greek government bonds at a deep discount during the crisis and it is willing to forego this, uh, this profit, hence indirectly participating uh, in the haircut, which I think is a, uh, is a part of a positive development. Now, of course, if you, um, uh, if you proceed with this public sector uh, initiative, what will happen is that the Greek banks, which hold approximately 40 billion um, uh, euros worth of, uh, of government debt, will suffer substantial losses. So the obvious next step uh, in order to break this deflationary spiral is to recapitalize all Greek banks uh, because uh, uh, they will technically not uh, meet the capital adequacy requirements. There are 30 billion euros earmarked uh, for this project. This project should take place within the next three months and this is not just a technical uh, problem that we have to solve. Uh, the Greek economy over the past two years has been plagued by a, a tremendous shortage in liquidity. Uh, banks, because they were facing uh, uh, severe liquidity problems, basically stopped you know, providing the economy with funds. So unless you, you solve the banking problem and allow the banks to start lending again, it's practically impossible for the economy uh, to, um, uh, to start uh, um, uh, you know, creating jobs and attracting uh, investment. And of course, the last component of this, uh, this rupture of this deflationary spiral, in my mind, has to do with taxation. The whole logic of increasing tax rates to um, uh, generate additional revenues has failed miserably. We need to start thinking in terms of reducing tax rates. We clearly went past that point on the, for those of you who are familiar with economics, of the Lafer curve by which increasing revenues uh, actually does not produce, uh, increasing tax rates does not produce uh, further revenue. So there's an argument to be made uh, about uh, possibly even reducing tax rates uh, at the moment. So this is the first component of what we need to do. The second, and in my mind possibly the most difficult component of what we need to do uh, is to completely revamp our public sector. Uh, Greek civil administration is problematic. Uh, it was the product of a political uh, system um, uh, which uh, used uh, the state towards its own uh, political interests. Uh, we have highly qualified people within our civil administration, highly qualified people. However, the whole system clearly uh, does not work. We need to rationalize um, uh, the role of government. What does government need to do and what it, it, it doesn't need to do? Uh, I'm sure this is a, a topic very relevant to the Fraser uh, <laughs> Institute. Uh, and uh, we also uh, need to look at uh, government uh, operations. I mean, uh, why is it that we've created this conundrum of, uh, uh, of legislation, uh, bureaucracy that eventually stif stifles any, uh, any, any private investment and, and makes uh, life of uh, all investors, be it domestic or foreign, um, so difficult? And we, of course, also need to, to combat corruption within um, uh, the, uh, the civil service and make sure that we instill clear rule of law, uh, laws applicable to everyone, whereas regardless of whether they're big uh, or small. Now, the best case study for this, in my mind, has to do with the tax bureaucracy. Uh, it is not just enough to reduce marginal tax rates. We need to completely redesign uh, our tax uh, bureaucracy and our tax legislation, which has been extremely cumbersome. And every time you see cumbersome legislation, that means that there is corruption hiding behind this, these levels of, uh, uh, of complexity. So we probably need to start from scratch and create kind of a new uh, independent uh, IRS using some of the young people who we have within the tax authorities, but also hiring new people. Uh, and uh, basically do uh, uh, a, a complete um, turnaround of the way we uh, collect uh, taxes. That is of, of paramount importance, because if you cannot tackle tax evasion, uh, reduce it, you're never going to eliminate it. But if you cannot reduce tax evasion, uh, you will never be able to solve your public finances. There's only that much room in terms of uh, uh, spending cuts. Greece right now collects 21% of, uh, uh, of its GDP in tax revenues. The European average is 32%. So these 10, 11 percentage points equate to around 20 billion euros per year in lost revenue. It would have solved all our deficit problems and allow us to have more money for our schools, our, our, our hospitals, and, and our pensions. So uh, reform of the tax administration, in my mind, is, is, the, is, of, uh, is of the utmost priority. And it's no coincidence that in the memorandum that we just signed, uh, in the basic document, which is around 30 pages, uh, four or five pages are actually devoted to how we're going to change 
uh, our tax administration uh, and make it uh, and make it more efficient. But what 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 holds true about tax also holds true about the entire uh, civil administration. This is a big horizontal project. The European Union has actually provided us with significant technical assistance, around 300 uh, EU experts in Greece at a ministerial level, trying to help ministers with these sorts of um, uh, of projects. And in my mind, it's probably the most difficult but the most important uh, project that we uh, have uh, ahead of us. Now, the, the last uh, component has to do with uh, how do you generate long-term growth? Um, where is the growth going to come uh, in, uh, in the country? And there, I think in my mind, it is pretty clear that Greece needs a, a very specific sectoral approach to its, uh, uh, to its growth strategy. Uh, actually, McKinsey, uh, put together a very interesting study a few months ago, uh, which it identified very specific sectors um, which uh, Greece can leverage to create growth. And the, the results of this study in terms of the numbers, I'm not going to bother you with those, are actually pretty impressive. But we more or less know which are the segments um, uh, from which growth can come. Tourism uh, is always going to be the flagship uh, of the Greek economy. Yet if you look at the numbers for tourism, yes, they were up uh, over the past year, which is good. But if you look at our neighbors, Turkey, Croatia, we are constantly losing market share uh, in, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this segment. We, we've done very little, for example, to foster cruise, uh, cruise uh, tourism, which is uh, uh, the fastest growing segment in, uh, uh, in, in the tourism industry. We just passed a law completely liberalizing um, uh, uh, the cruise industry, thus attracting more cruise ships uh, to, to Greece. So there's a lot of scope to do work on that front. And there's no doubt that our tourism product has to be high-level, environmentally sustainable tourism. Um, uh, the good thing when you lag behind the curve is that you avoid mistakes that other countries made. For example, Spain completely overbuilt its, its coastline, facing both a real estate bubble and a big environmental disaster. So in, in my mind, the model is very clear. You need high-end, sustainable um, uh, tourist development, including uh, second homes for retirees, uh, very much in line with where the tourist industry is going. But tourism is always going to be an important sector. Uh, energy is going to be a very important sector for, uh, uh, for Greece. Uh, it's conventional energy and renewables. We're blessed with ample uh, with solar, wind, geothermal power. There's a lot of investment going into the sector. Uh, a lot more uh, can be done. And of course, there's an increasing debate going on in, in Greece over the past year as to how we leverage our, uh, our natural uh, resources. Greece is a, is a rich country, um, uh, very uh, important mineral resources. Canadian companies such as El Dorado Gold, uh, which is represented here uh, today, I'm, I'm glad to see, has a, a very important uh, investments uh, in Greece uh, in, in gold mining. Uh, planning to invest a significant of amount of money uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this process. This is certainly a sector which we uh, need to, uh, to push much uh, further, uh, being mining by you know, proper environmental standards is, is standard practice these, uh, uh, these days. So uh, I am the shadow minister of the environment, but I don't buy the argument that uh, a priori any mining operation is bad for the, uh, for the environment. There are ways of, of, of doing this uh, in a proper way, and we still need to leverage those. Then there's agricultural production, high-end agricultural goods. Uh, it's strange that Greece um, is uh, uh, exporting um, most of its olive oil in bulk. 90% of Greek olive oil is exported in bulk to Italy, nicely repackaged and sold as Italian uh, olive oil. <laughs> uh, I think that this is something we could, we could do, um, uh, we could do uh, ourselves. And then, obviously, services, uh, um, uh, health care, uh, high-end education. Uh, we take a sector approach, we will find that there are significant pockets of growth within the, within the Greek economy that we can leverage. And that is, in a sense, the, the new uh, kind of uh, frontier where we need to take Greece. I mean, the era of uh, stimulating growth through public spending is, is over. We are um, no longer able to do that. Uh, investment has to come uh, from the private sector, be it domestic uh, or, uh, or foreign. Now, the whole question is, can we do all this? And the, the million dollar question is, is whether the uh, is the political environment conducive to these types uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of reforms? Uh, can we maintain the sort of social cohesion while going through this difficult uh, uh, path? Um, what will the European Union do? Will it undermine our efforts or will it assist us uh, in, in this big struggle that we have 
uh, ahead of us. Uh, as far as politics, Greek politics is concerned, I think that there has been a significant change over the past months. Uh, even within the two main parties, it's very clear who are the reform-minded politicians who want to see Greece's future close to the European Union, and who are those who envision a different uh, uh, road uh, um, of possible isolation, uh, always putting forward uh, nice uh, arguments regarding our national independence and pride, but without really suggesting anything concrete uh, after, uh, after those. So in my mind, the, lands, the lines have been very clearly drawn uh, in, in the sand. We have 199 MPs who support doing the difficult work in order to keep Greece within uh, the, the European uh, Union. Yes, we have voices of, uh, of skepticism uh, within, uh, within Greece and voices of populism. It is only natural that these voices will have an audience in times of social uh, turmoil. But I think our job is to make it very clear uh, that we have a very clear idea of where we want to take the country. This task is difficult, but it is doable. Uh, and we want to be responsible towards our creditors and do our fair share uh, and assume our fair share of the, of the burden. Now, let me just conclude by making a few points about the role of the European uh, Union. Unfortunately, um, over the past, uh, especially over the past days, uh, we've heard uh, remarks from various European countries and various European officials um, uh, which uh, are not very helpful in the direction we want to take um, uh, uh, the, the country. The rhetoric of the Greek um, Euroskeptics um, um, gains credibility when some of our European partners basically behave like medieval despots, because that's you know what we receive in Greece uh, as as a mes uh, you know as a message. I mean, we will do our fair share of our deal. We're not asking for a free ride here. Let me be absolutely clear. Uh, the Greek public has suffered. A lot of the past two years, I think it has behaved uh, with great dignity, understanding that we need to change and we need to, uh, to, to uh, adjust. But when some of our European partners um, almost kind of humiliate an, an entire nation that has made a lot of sacrifices, uh, I don't think this is very productive. Of course, we want deadlines, we want targets, but some of the comments that we've heard have really not been very helpful. And uh, I went back. Um, uh, to my textbooks and uh, read what John Maynard Keynes wrote uh, in 1920 in a, piece of work, in a piece of work called The Economic Consequences of Peace, when he actually made the point that you should not push Germany very hard um, in terms of uh, um, asking too much uh, from the German people, because you will plunge the economy in a deep recession and you may have unforeseen political consequences. And he was uh, absolutely right. So I think that Germany, in particular, should remember uh, this, uh, uh, this message uh, today when it deals with, uh, with Greece. Um, uh, we will be responsible, and we will be able to get the country uh, out of this uh, uh, difficult situation. I have no doubt about that. We faced many crises in our, uh, in our history. We will, we will succeed uh, once more, because for the first time, I really see the resolve within the political system and within Greek society. We came very close to the precipice. We realized the risks. We took a step back, and we know what we have to do. Uh, but uh, the Euro and let me conclude with this point. The European uh, Union was founded on a healthy balance of national responsibility and European solidarity. And it is that balance that Europe needs to rediscover. Thank you very much. <laughs>